Following Marcella's presentation, to complement findings from the literature and the scoping interviews, we also analyzed information from publicly available sources listed on the WHO Global Observatory on Health Research and Development, including the World Report, GFinder, and the WHO International Clinical Trial Registry platform. To understand pharmaceutical R&D activities in low- and middle-income countries, we focused on three indicators – funding flow, health research capacities, and clinical trial activities. For R&D funding, we synthesized data on gross domestic R&D expenditure on health and medical sciences, referred to as Health GERD. We found that South Africa, Kenya, and Mozambique were the countries with the highest percentage of GDP invested in Health GERD in their respective income groups. In terms of health researchers per million inhabitants, Bulgaria had the highest number among upper-middle-income countries and Egypt among lower-middle-income countries. There was no low-income countries among the top 10 low- and middle-income countries. We also examined grants for biomedical research from public and philanthropic funders in the World Report, which is a publicly accessible database managed by the U.S. National Institute of Health. Among low- and middle-income countries, South Africa had the highest number of grants, followed by China and Kenya. In terms of the number of research organizations receiving grants, China, South Africa, and Brazil had the highest number among upper-middle-income countries. India and Kenya had the highest number among middle-income countries, and Uganda and Malawi had the highest number among low-income countries. We then look at data on R&D funding from the GFinder database, which is a project by Policy Cures Research tracking R&D funding for diseases that disproportionately affect the world's most disadvantaged populations. From 2010 to 2020, there was an increase of more than 450% in the total amount funded by middle-income countries, while funding from low-income countries remained roughly the same. Among low- and middle-income countries, India was the most significant public funder. The top receiving countries of funding were India and South Africa. Having looked at the R&D funding flows and research capacities, we then turn to the analysis results of clinical trial activities. Clinical trials are critical parts of the R&D process for developing pharmaceuticals. The principal aim of this analysis was to identify which low- and middle-income countries are the most active ones in conducting and or hosting clinical trials. For our analysis, we used a curated data set from a study by Laura Merson and others, which cleaned data from the WHO ICTRP. We then added information on phases and disease types to the curated data set and created our unique data set for this study, which is available as a supplementary data. We looked at data from 1990 to December 2020. However, most data became available only after 1998 and early 2000. We first look at the number of trials. During the period covered, about 80% of the clinical trials were conducted in high-income countries but we also saw a rapid growth in low- and middle-income countries. From 2010 to 2020, the share of trials in low- and middle-income countries increased from 5% to 28%. From 2010 to 2020, the number of trials in low- and middle-income countries also increased by 375%. We also identified the top 20 low- and middle-income countries with the highest number of trials. China, India, and Iran were the top three low- and middle-income countries conducting clinical trials during this period. There was also significant growth in the number of trials in these three countries from 2010 to 2020. We were also interested in the phases of these clinical trials. Clinical trials were usually categorized into four phases. The earlier phases are usually more innovative research and are riskier, while phase three studies are conducted on large populations and are often the step right before a new treatment is approved. Phase four studies take place after the product is approved. 
we found that most trials were in phase three in both high-income countries and low- and middle-income countries. Most of the top 20 low- and middle-income countries had a relatively larger share of trials in phase two and phase three. However, we also found that China and India had a larger proportion of trials in phase zero and phase one. There was a significant increase in phase zero trials in low- and middle-income countries from 2010 to 2020. In particular, Egypt and Thailand show significant growth in earlier phases of R&D. These trends indicated increasing capacity in the riskier, more innovative earlier stages of R&D in low- and middle-income countries. We also look at the disease types. In both high-income countries and low- and middle-income countries, the largest number of trials were for malignant neoplasm. Infectious and parasitic diseases represented only about 5% of trials in high-income countries and 9% in low- and middle-income countries. Over time, there was a significant increase in trials for respiratory diseases in all countries. In low- and middle-income countries, other categories also increased significantly, particularly non-communicable diseases and congenital anomalies. Finally, we look at the sponsors and founders of the trials. In the study by Laura Merson and others, the sponsors and founders of each trial were categorized as commercial or non-commercial. Commercial was defined as organizations where evidence of a profit-driven corporate mission or company structure was identified. Non-commercial was defined as organizations where evidence of non-profit status was identified, including governments, foundations, academic and research institutions, healthcare provision facilities, and public health agencies. We draw on this categorization and analyze the distribution of commercial and non-commercial founders and sponsors. The analysis show a higher number of non-commercial than commercial sponsors in all countries and a higher number of non-commercial founders in low- and middle-income countries. From this analysis, we observed an increasing involvement of non-commercial actors over the past years, particularly in the earlier R&D phases. In some disease areas, such as maternal conditions, sexual health, perinatal conditions, and nutritional deficiency, non-commercial actors play a markedly dominant role. So for the second objective of the uh, report, which was to identify innovative proposals uh, of pharmaceutical R&G in low and middle income countries, uh, we did a mapping uh, of the proposals that were submitted to the WHO in response to an open call in 2013 following the process of the consultative executive working group on research and development. So uh, they opened a, a, a call for anyone interested in submitting proposals uh, of different ways of conducting pharmaceutical RNGs, especially uh, focused in addressing the needs uh, of low- and middle-income countries. So we were able to map uh, retrieve information uh, for 52 proposals out of 106 that were submitted to this open call. Uh, most of the proposals, they were submitted by governments, public research institutions, and universities. And out of the 52 proposals that we were able to retrieve information, 34 were uh, submitted uh, by organizations based in 23 low- and middle-income countries. You can refer to Table 9 for a list of those countries uh, categorized in regions, so from the African region, Asian region, and Latin American region. And you can also see Appendix 5.3 of the report for more information and a full list of the proposals submitted by organizations based in LMICs. So what we believe is important to highlight from uh, this mapping exercise is the important role of non-commercial actors uh, in this process, and also that there is at least a willingness to take alternative approaches to RNG models in low- and middle-income countries. Finally, some of the discussion of the results and conclusions of the report 
uh, we think that there is still very limited data uh, data available, uh, talking about pharmaceutical uh, innovation in low and middle income countries. There is uh, information that is sparse uh, and difficult to find, even if we have the WHO RNG uh, observatory that was uh, created to bring together uh, this information. The information that we could identify is still very limited in scope, as most of, most of it refer only to a subset uh, of diseases. The information about funders also refer to only a subset uh, of, uh, of funders, uh, most of which are based in high-income countries. There's very little information about research being funded by uh, low- and middle-income countries. Uh, some of the interviewees did uh, mention that uh, some countries have national databases uh, for this type of information, but we, uh, it was beyond the scope of our research, at least at this point, to go into each of the national uh, databases. But still, we believe that by triangulating the literature review with the scope interviews and the database analysis of the open uh, databases that we could identify, we were able to paint at least a broad picture of who was involved in pharmaceutical R&D in low middle income countries, in which particular countries uh, there were more activity taking place, for which type of diseases, uh, also in which R&D phases, and with what results. And we also identify changes over time, especially in the past decade. Uh, and you can see here uh, in the screen uh, the list of uh, top 16 low and middle income countries involved in pharmaceutical RNG that we uh, put together by, by analyzing uh, the top uh, performing countries in the different uh, indicators and sources that we analyzed throughout our report. And what would we could uh, see is that there is growing investment in RNG, uh, particularly from middle-income countries. We also saw growing capacity uh, for conducting uh, RNG activities, which was indicated by the increase in the number of research organizations and the amount of funding received to conduct biomedical um, projects in those countries. We also saw a growing number of clinical trials in LMACs, including in the earlier, more innovative and riskier phases of the process. Uh, finally, we would like to highlight the very significant and growing role of non-commercial funding uh, funders and sponsors of clinical trials. And that uh, role is important not only in low- and middle-income countries, even if it was more significant in those countries, but also in high-income countries as well. So the high number of non-commercial actors suggest that at least fertile soils for alternative ING models uh, exist in low- and middle-income countries that are not driven primarily by market incentives and hopefully can lead to better public health outcomes.